we're in a situation now where the Bronx is seen as such a hot market and there's so much potential here. And so there's a lot of speculative investment and tons of money flowing in. And I think the issue is how does investment come in? Who does it build wealth for? Researcher and writer Gregory Joss was at the Bronx Historical Society for a lecture on how redlining defined the Bronx and America. So I think it's really important for people to understand the history of how these things got, these different policies got created and what was the thinking behind them. If we're going to do something differently, we need to understand that history. And I think the story of, of Dalma De La Rosa, so one day she came home from um, running errands and the super was sitting on the front steps crying because the landlord had walked away from the building and taken the boiler with them. And so now they were caught up in the situation where they had a choice. They could either leave their building or they could stay and fight. So being very inspired by stories of people like Dalma who stayed to fight for their buildings and their neighborhoods and identified that they needed the reinvestment to make it happen. And that story continues to be a guiding force in his career. After graduating from Fordham, he worked at the University Avenue Neighborhood Housing Program during the 1990s, where he saw firsthand the results of redlining. In 1933, an organization was formed called the Home Owners Loan Corporation, or HOLC, created to reduce home foreclosures during the Depression. It turned into the 1937 U.S. Housing Act, which was later called the Federal Housing Association, also known as FHA. Both the HOLC and the FHA determine what neighborhoods were unfit for investment by banks. You can see the areas physically marked off in red, a practice which ultimately served to drastically reduce home ownership among African Americans and other people of color. In the Bronx, it affected Black Americans and Puerto Ricans, something Jos called a continuation of Jim Crow New Deal era housing policies. Jim Crow had a way of turning everyone against one another, not just white against black or landed against lowly, but poor against poor and black against black for an extra scrap of privilege. Angel Rodriguez, director of programs and external affairs at the Bronx Historical Society, said that he felt it necessary to shed light on redlining and how it impacted the borough. And things are rapidly changing here in the borough. So I think it's very important that we learn about the more contemporary history of the Bronx because it pretty much puts in context the Bronx life we live in today. So the question I asked was, does redlining exist today in the Bronx? And the Bronx Historical Society says it does. It's more subtle based on income, certainly not like it existed 50 to 60 years ago. For BronxNet, this is Arlene McCucko.